All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Vanderberg. I am a member of council and what is described as the Zoom host for this morning service. Welcome to River Park Church. In a moment, I will be handing the reins over to Hans Spielman, who will be the council host for this morning service. And then he will pass it off to Kay Sfink to, to, to provide us with uh, the sermon today, which is in fact his final sermon uh, with us. So we're very thankful that he's able to return to, to do that for us today. I'd like to give a special word of gratitude to uh, Kara Milne and Dan Visser, who offered to provide us with uh, additional hosting for this morning's service in terms of the Zoom component of it. So that was, that was really helpful to have them uh, welcoming people upon arrival and then also making sure that people were muted as required to make sure that there isn't too much feedback and, and noise, but allowing us to have unmuted microphones most of the time because that's the, that's the whole point of this Zoom component of our service, the interaction, the communication, the conversation, just looking at each other's smiling faces. So that's exactly what we intended for this. Uh, I noticed there were some people that were that were logging on as early as uh, 9.20 this morning. So maybe next week we start a little bit earlier to give you even more of this uh, time of seeing each other's faces and smiling and connecting before we move into the service. But for this week, we started that at 9.45 and now I'll be passing it off to uh, Hans to provide us with the uh, service itself. So what I'll do is I will unmute uh, Hans and uh, I will find him here, unmute and hand over the reins. Thanks very much. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, <coughs> and uh, welcome to everyone to our third uh, online Zoom worship service and this uh, second Sunday of after Easter. A uh, special welcome to Morris and Betty, which I just heard uh, it's apparently it's their anniversary day today. Um, Pastor Kay Fink will be opening the word to us this morning, including a children's message. And following the, the sermon, Pastor Case will lead us in communion, and he will guide us through the communion process. Also, after the service, uh, you're invited to join a Zoom breakout room for fellowship, if you so wish. Jeff will randomly divide us into smaller breakout groups. If you're interested in joining, all you have to do is stay online after the service has ended. At this point, I would uh, like to open our time of worship by reading a few verses from the Easter account as recorded in Matthew 28. So the women hurried after the tomb, uh, hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. As Jesus greeted the women outside of the empty tomb, so he also greets us every Sunday and every day. And as those women, we are invited to respond by worshipping our Lord today. The worship uh, team will now lead us into singing and uh, texts are included at the bottom of the screen and you're invited to join in worship.
but we'll just have a few short announcement and that will, will lead us into a congregational prayer. Um, first of all, we want to thank all of you who had found ways to continue to support the weekly diagonal classes as well as the River Park Church Ministries. This week, the diagonal class is a dynamic youth ministry, which provides programs, materials, and training to bring children and youth into a living, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have any questions on how to support these causes remotely, please contact donations at riverparkchurch.com or any of the deacons. And secondly, I would like to mention that at this time of the year, we seek nominations for various leadership positions in the church, such as council members, deacons, and pastoral elders. In addition, we would like to initiate the vision support team for a September startup. If you are interested in any of these roles, please contact Darren, Jeff, or myself. At this point, I would like to lead us in our prayer. Dear Lord, you promised, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We pray for the families and loved ones of those who perished this week in Nova Scotia through acts of senseless violence in what was aptly described by Queen Elizabeth as appalling events. Be near to them and comfort them in their time of grief and be with everyone who has been touched by these events. The neighbors and towns, the province of Nova Scotia, and indeed Canada as a nation, as we unite in expressing our sorrow and our support for those most closely affected. Dear Lord, we also continue to pray for your protection from the virus that is stalking us and its effects. We especially pray for those who are currently fighting the infection, that you may be present near them. We pray for those most vulnerable due to age, underlying health issues, or other factors. For those among us who are suffering from a life-threatening illness, and who in addition to fighting those conditions, have a weakened ability to fight the virus. For those with compromised immune systems. For those who are in long-term care homes and other institutional settings. For members of Riverbark Church, so very dear to us, as well as for all others. We pray for all of them and for all of us, for your peace and presence when we face this threat together. We pray for the frontline medical staff and caregivers in the hospitals and care institutions, for other essential workers in grocery stores, in food production, in transportation, and many other areas, that you may strengthen their courage. We also pray for those of us who have been affected in many different ways by the isolation and economic disruption that we are experiencing, either through loss of work, income, or mental stress. Be near to all. Dear Lord, we also want to pray for your wisdom, for wisdom for those in leadership positions, for our civic, provincial, and national governments, as well as for the leadership of other countries, especially those who have limited resources to address emergencies. We pray for wisdom for the Church of Jesus Christ, here locally and everywhere, that it may be your witness of faith, hope, and love. We pray for wisdom for all of us to know how to be present and to be a blessing to those around us, our families, our neighbors, and each other. Dear Lord, we want to pray for your blessing. Your blessing for Pastor K. Fink as he preaches his last sermon as our pastor, that your spirit will speak through him once more. We thank you for his ministry among us over the last year and a half through the preaching from your word and through his wise counsel. We pray for effective treatment for Case in his ongoing health concerns. And we ask for him and his wife, Maria, for your blessing as they embark on a new journey together with you. We pray for blessing for Pastor Gary Bonhoff as he prepares to minister to us starting in May, that you inspire him with your spirit to nourish us through the ministry of the word. We pray for a blessing for all staff and volunteers of River Park Church who continue to serve in new and different ways, particularly also our worship teams and leaders. 
as well as the search committee members as they continue their work. We pray for a blessing on the offerings that people bring, both in support of our ministries and of the causes that have been highlighted by the deacons, such as this week for Dynamic Youth Ministries. And we pray for the celebration of communion that we are invited to participate in today, that it may nourish our souls. Dear Lord, I will finish this prayer to you with words from the new St. Joseph prayer book. The resurrection of your son has given us new life and renewed hope. Help us to live as new people in pursuit of the Christian ideal Grant us wisdom to know what we must do, the will to want to do it, the courage to undertake it, the perseverance to continue to do it, and the strength to complete it. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. This point, uh, Pastor Case will lead us in the message and children's message. Good morning. Um, uh, this morning we are going to go green. So, um, and it's going to go evergreen is the focus for our message this morning. But uh, because this uh, story from Ezekiel uh, chapter 17 is a story about trees. And, but first of all, I'd like to uh, just see what's inside my candy bag. <laughs> Looks like we have some pictures in the candy bag this morning. And the first one looks like this. So the two words on here, and if any of you kids can read it, um, what do you see? Big, right? And small, small and big. And the question really for this morning is how do you get to go from small to big. So for example, if I show you this picture, you see something small on it, and that would be a baby chick, and you see something large on it, that would be a rooster or a hen. So how does a baby chick grow into a rooster and become, or a hen? So here, the next one I've got to show you is this one. One of these things is small and one is big. One's a golf ball, that's pretty small. And one's a soccer ball, which is much bigger, it's quite big. And lastly, I want to show you two people. One is small and one is bigger. And you can pick out the one that's small, right? The little baby is small and the young girl, like you kids, is bigger. So the question I have is how do you get to go from being small to being bigger? How do you get to go from being a baby to being a child and from you as kids, how do you get to grow into adults? The Bible says that it's God who gives us growth. It's God who makes all things grow. And in our story from today, we're going to read about a little sprig of an evergreen tree and how that little sprig begins to grow because God gives it life. That's how we grow, right? So when you go from a baby to a girl, I think that happens to golf balls too, right? If a golf, golf ball keeps growing, it will grow into a soccer ball, doesn't it? Or maybe not. Maybe not. That might not work. Because I think when the Bible talks about God making things alive and making things grow, he's talking only about living things like trees and plants and animals and people. So as we read the story this morning in, in the Bible, I just want you to think about the fact that 
God has made you the size you are now, and God keeps you growing, both physically and spiritually, both in your heart and in your life. God is the one who provides all the growth that we have. And thanks be to God. As we read this story now about from Ezekiel chapter 17, about the evergreen tree. There we go. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set forth an allegory and tell it to the Israelites a parable and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. A great eagle with powerful wings, long feathers, and full plumage of varied colors came to Lebanon, taking hold of the top of a cedar. He broke it off its topmost shoot and carried it away to the land of merchants where he planted it in a city of traders. He took one of the seedlings of the land and put it in fertile soil. He planted it like a willow by abundant water and it sprouted and became a low and a spreading vine. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out leafy boughs. But there was another great eagle with powerful wings and full plumage. The vine now sent out its roots toward him from the plot where it was planted and stretched out its branches to him for water. It had been planted in good soil by abundant water, so it, bear, uh, it produced branches and bear fruit and become a splendid vine. Now say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, will it thrive? Will it not be uprooted and stripped of its fruit so that it withers? All its new growth will wither. It will not take a strong arm or many people pull it up by its roots. Where it's been planted, but will it thrive? Will it not wither completely when the east wind strikes it? Wither away in the plot where it grew. And then the word of the Lord came to me, say to this rebellious people, don't you know what these things mean? Say to them, the king of Babylon went to Jerusalem, carried off the king and her nobles, bringing them back with him to Babylon. And then he took a member of the royal family and made a treaty with them, putting him under oath. He also carried away the leading men of the land so that the kingdom would be brought low and unable to rise again, surviving only by keeping his treaty. But the king rebelled against him by sending his envoys to Egypt to get horses in a large army. And will he succeed? Will he who does think these things escape? Will he break the treaty and yet escape? As surely as I live, declares the Lord, he'll die in Babylon in the land of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised and treaty he broke. Pharaoh with his mighty army and his great horde will be of no help to him in war. When the ramps are built and the siege works erected to destroy many lives. He despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Because he had given his hand in pledge and yet did all these things, he will not escape. And therefore, this is what the Lord says, as surely as I live, I'll repay him for despising my oath and breaking the covenant. I'll spread a net for him and he'll be caught in my snare. I'll bring him to Babylon and execute judgment on him there because he was unfaithful to me. And all his choice troops will fall by the swords, and the survivors will be scattered to the winds. And then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, now comes our text for this morning. These are the last two verses, and kind of an appendix allegory prophecy that uh, Ezekiel gives. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I, myself, will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar, and I will plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and a lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I'll plant it. It'll produce branches. It'll bear fruit. It will become a splendid cedar. And birds of every kind will nest in it. They'll find shelter in the shade of its branches. And all the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I'll dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Two eagles 
and a cedar tree. Two eagles and a cedar tree. In Jasper, when we used to go to Jasper, there's a spot uh, that we would go to watch uh, the eagles nest way up in a spruce tree. It was like the branches reached up uh, to hold this massive eagle's nest way up at the top of the spruce tree. And a pair of eagles there would come back year after year. And sometimes we'd catch them just as they were beginning to uh, refurbish their nest, do lanos. Uh, sometimes we'd catch them as they were uh, beginning to feed their young and fly back and forth with food. And the tree that stood there served those eagles. Now, this parable is not about nesting eagles. This parable is actually about um, yeah, competing eagles, I guess. Competing eagles. It's really a story about politics. Now, Israel is supposed to be the chosen people to live out God's salvation. But the country was positioned right between two giant empires. On the one hand, on the north, uh, at the north and east was the Babylonian Empire, and to the south and west was the Egyptian Empire. Now, the royal house, the Egyptian uh, or the Israelite royal house, the king and all his leaders and his warriors were uh, taken. They were the top of the cedar, and they were taken to Babylon and taken into exile because God was wanting to renew his people. His people hadn't been doing well. They hadn't been living as his chosen people. And so he, he wanted them to get back and focus on their original purpose that they were uh, created for. But at that point, alas, entered politics into the situation, as often does. The Israelites, when they were in exile in Babylon, started looking for a way out. They started looking to the other eagle, the second eagle, the Egyptian Empire, as a way for rescue. Uh, and God said, no dice, this is not going to work. I am going to keep you in exile, and I'm going to destroy the king, and I'm going to destroy his warriors and uh, the leaders of the Israelite people. I think one of the messages in that is that any time that God's people uh, play politics or power games, it just is not going to turn out well. And it's true whether it's uh, the Egyptian the Egyptians and the, or the uh, Israelite, Israelites, or whether it's RPC or our personal lives. Following God is just not about power, and it's not about manipulation, and it's not about politics. Now, the best part of this whole parable is the last part, the prophecy in the last two verses. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of the cedar, I'll plant it, I'll break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I'll plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. And birds of every kind will nest in it. They'll find shelter in the shade of its branches. And all the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Now, pro prophecy in the Bible is always layered. It's multi-layered. Um, in the, the first fulfillment happens in the Old Testament when the exile ends, and God provides a brand new king who reigns in Jerusalem. The second fulfillment, or I think the critical fulfillment, is when Jesus Christ comes and is that small planting on top of a hill, on top of Golgotha. And Jesus says, and I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. The birds of the air come and nest in the branches of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was crucified but raised from the dead so that today every dead tree can become alive. Ezekiel says God gives the dead tree new life. So first Jesus, and then you, and River Park Church. What God is growing through us who follow Jesus Christ 
is the seed that's going to grow into this terrific shrub that nourishes nesting and nourishes life. That's the vision of the kingdom of God. I was, uh, as usual, sitting in the morning uh, in a chair by my uh, living room window, uh, watching uh, two chickadees who come back every year, uh, and we have a huge spruce tree outside the window, and they were just flitting about, and they were chirping up a symphony, and they were preparing their annual nesting in the, in the spruce tree. And I just absolutely love watching them. They just have such joy and such courage, and um, they have a sense of safety, and they have a sense of shelter and purpose and community as they make their homes in the branches of the tree out front. About a year and a half ago, I came to you at River Park Church. And uh, you at the time were a wounded church. And uh, some things in the church were broken and some things were damaged. And many people at the church had left. But you, you didn't, you stayed. In spite of all the turmoil, you stayed and you tried to take care of each other, and you kept offering ministry programs. And in the meantime, we began to work on healing from our wounds. We created a safer church. We uh, started working more closely together as a leadership team and as congregation. We started developing a new vision for the church, a new model for leadership, and uh, started creating this uh, new vision implementation team. There's been also been, in the last year and a half, a renewal in the pastoral elders and in the deacons and in your current leadership. And there's been this uh, also a revisal of a dedication to finally integrating our multicultural ministry together. Plus, we started the search for a new pastor. We've begun uh, a growing time in our worship, uh, with the addition of Henrik to our, our staff. And I hope that you have been able to pick up a new sense of hopeless, hopefulness and a, hope, a new sense of purposefulness in the church, a new spirit. It's actually been really awesome for me to have been a part of that uh, whole process over the last year and a half and to uh, just contribute my little part to that. And what has really impressed me uh, at River Park Church has been uh, your devotion, your, uh, what I experienced as an increase in love for one another and your commitment to serve. And the way that you're beginning to live, um, how can I say it, just heart to heart in a much deeper way, more openly and more honestly with, with each other. Well, at this time, I'm going to be leaving you as your transition minister. Uh, but you're well underway uh, in your renewal. And Pastor Gary is going to come on board, and he's going to provide you um, with greater depth of preaching and with more pastoral care uh, as the search for your new pastor finds its fulfillment as God leads you. So I want to leave you with this wonderful image that God gives us in this passage from Ezekiel that has already found its fulfillment in a uh, new king uh, being given to Israel and in the coming of Christ, in Jesus' death and in Jesus' resurrection, um, and now finds also its fulfillment in you. This is an image about you, the church of Jesus Christ. You are the evergreen that has been grown from this little sprig Jesus Christ planted on a high hill. Jesus who said in John, I am the vine and you are the branches, remain in me. And so out of this passage, I just want to share with you a few congregational uh, evergreen principles for life. You know, they're just congregations, they're good for your personal life, they're good for your life together as church. These are things that are going to make you thrive. And the first one is, keep your faith personal. Keep your faith personal 
because God is personal and God is personally involved. Verse 22 says, I will take a shoot. This is God talking. I will break off the tender sprig. I will plant it. I will bring down the tall tree. I'll make the low tree grow tall. I'll dry up the green tree. I will make the dry tree flourish. I will do it. Do you hear it? God, your God is personally involved in everything that you are together. And I just want you to picture that for a minute. Picture God planting. Picture yourself in a spring garden, bent over the earth, on your haunches, grubbing around in the dirt, noticing where the plants might need a bit of help or which one might need to be moved. Because this is the image of God. God in Jesus Christ has dirt under his fingernails. Now, when we share communion in a few minutes, you're going to see and taste and swallow and digest the life of Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus Christ that is personally invested in you. So keep your faith personally invested in Jesus Christ. This ministry at River Park, it's just not about building a successful church. God does not need and want churches. God needs people willing to get their hands dirty, holding out their branches to the world. So keep your faith personal. And secondly, focus on your passion. And the reason I say this coming out of this parable is it's, this is about an evergreen. This is about a flourishing tree. This is about a living organism with the life and the love of God pulsing through it. This is the miracle of from small to big. And I've said it often at River Park, is that minute meetings serve ministry and organization serves ministry. And so the question is, what is it that makes you love God and love the place that God has planted you? You are alive in Christ, God says. I make the dry tree flourish. So focus, secondly, focus on your passion and live out of that. And that's really also the next point. The next point is really about integrating your vision and your ministry. It's about not just dreaming it, but living it. It's about you making a difference. This prophetic parable doesn't stop by showing you just a picture of an evergreen tree. It's not enough to see yourself being a new living, uh, a living person in Jesus Christ, a living creation in Jesus Christ. The tree is a very active tree in this parable. The life flowing through those branches creates life through the fruit that the tree bears. It creates life for birds of every kind that come to nest in, in the tree branches. The life of the tree is passed on to the baby birds that soon begin to chirp in the new nestings. Vision flows into ministry. Life passes on life. So don't just have a vision. Live that vision out more and more every day. And fourthly, uh, I think the tree also teaches us that we need to live intimately with each other. Create safety and create shade. That's what the tree does. It becomes an absolutely wonderful place where others can, and that includes you, where you can nest and be at home. It's a place where the birds can chirp and flit and are busy passing on life to the little ones that hatch. So protect each other's lives in the church. A, a church should be a place that love runs deep and allows everyone to grow. It's a place to be heart to heart with one another 
held up in the branches of this church. And fifthly, draw others into your life. Draw others, directly invite them into your lives, directly invite them into your homes and into your worship, your laughter, your faith. Join them when they're in their hard times and give them places of safety, places of rest, places that they can nest in. As Jesus says himself in the Gospels, he says, compel them to come in, draw them to come in. It's a banquet and birds of every kind are going to nest in your branches. It's awesome. And they will find shelter in the branches of this tree. And lastly, I just will ask you to remember uh, the, what the uh, parable also keeps reminding us of. I have spoken and I will do it, says God. Your future as a church, it involves you, but it doesn't depend on you. It's not yours. The same God who spoke at creation and, and said, let it come, and it became into being, that same God says in this parable, I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. You have seen that in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death of sin and in life everlasting, God is, is spoken and God will do it through you because you are the evergreen. I'd like to uh, lead us in, the, in prayer. Gracious God, we uh, thank you that you hold this vision before us of who we are in you. We thank you for the life that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the healing that we have in Christ. We thank you for the renewal that's always going on in our lives and in our lives together. And we are grateful. We just are so grateful that you have pointed us uh, to the sprig planted on Gulf at Golgotha, to your son, Jesus. And we ask you, to bless us as we celebrate this communion, as we see in these elements your love for us. May your spirit move our hearts, and may we experience a you in our life and in each other's lives as we come together uh, to find our blessing in the bread and in the cup. Lord, hear our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we um, turn to communion, uh, if you haven't got your communion elements uh, ready, please quickly <laughs> grab them, your bread and your juice or our wine, and uh, uh, gather them here. I have, I have mine here, and I'll put them here. And uh, while you're getting ready uh, where you are, let me say something about, uh, I have a communion cup, as you can see, and a uh, communion uh, a pouring cup, and also a plate to hold the bread. This set was uh, personally made for me by um, people up in Edmonton when I was a hospital chaplain. So I just want you to know that this uh, communion set, which involves the cup and uh, a plate for the bread, this has, um, this has been at the bedsides of people who were dying. It has been, um, in the circle of families who have suffered much. Uh, it has been in the chapel of hospitals where people have gathered around to do exactly what we are doing today, which is to remember the body and the blood of Christ. Um, it has served to bring comfort and hope in many different places. And today, I want to share that same uh, comfort and hope with you through uh, this communion together. Here, these, uh, these are the promises, the gracious words that God gave us to help us uh, celebrate this feast. Come to me, all of you who are hung hungry or who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle, I'm humble in heart, 
you will find rest for your soul. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. So lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's lift them up to the God of our salvation. On the night that uh, Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he poured it, and he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I invite you to join me in sharing this communion meal. Take it, eat, remember, believe that the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for a complete forgiveness of all our sins. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Now take it and drink. Remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for a complete washing away of all our sins.
wish my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay So as we uh, leave each other today, I, um, in terms of the worship, I uh, just want to invite you to the breakout groups after uh, the session. And the question that I'm uh, raising for each of you is, which one of the principles that I mentioned in the message uh, are most important to you? And which one, has, um, which one speaks to you most and why? And uh, why are they important to you? So as we leave today, I just want to leave you with a blessing of your God, the blessing of your Savior. Um, may you uh, always be loved by him. Uh, may you uh, find your home in his heart and also in our life together. I invite you to join us again next week for worship. But now as we leave, I offer you God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Um, at this time, um, hopefully people can hear me. My name is uh, Mike Brennan, and uh, I'm the chair of uh, River Park Church. Uh, I'd like to do something here that uh, perhaps Case wasn't a little, wasn't aware of, but at this uh, point in the service, just before we go to the breakout rooms, I'd like to take a special opportunity to say a few words of thanks on behalf of River Park Church as we mark the last Sunday that uh, Pastor Case will be with us on staff as he officially retires at the end of this coming week. Um, Case, as he mentioned, as has been mentioned, joined River Park Church in October 2018 as our classic classes appointed specialized transition minister. The intent was that he would be with us for a while or so to guide us through a journey together in a time where we reflected on our past and looked ahead to the future that God had for us. In that year and a half that Case has been with us, he has guided us through many things, which started, as he noted, with a time of mourning. Mourning a separation with our previous pastor and continued from there into a time of reflection and rebuilding. It was at this point that I was planning to share many of the very significant activities that uh, Case walked alongside with us and helped us to achieve as a congregation and as a body of believers. Um, Case actually mentioned 
almost all of those things this morning, so I won't go through the list again. But it was a very long and significant list that brought us from a place of mourning to a very different place where we are here today. Not a bad list, I would say, for um, a specialized trans transition minister who was hired part-time and who was already supposedly in semi-retirement. So thank you, Case, for that. As I personally reflect on our time with Case, um, two things particularly stand out as highlights. Firstly, Case's calm but strong leadership to help us to understand and to be patient as we journeyed through our period of transition and change. Secondly, but perhaps even most memorably, is Case's very colorful bag of surprises, which he used for children's stories and used again today. You never knew what Case was gonna pull out of that bag, and you always knew that not only the children, but adults alike, would be drawn in with great interest into what he was about to say and to share with us. Earlier this week, we had a bit of an exit interview with Case um, in which he talked about and left us with um, many different things, but in particular, the thoughts that he shared with us through his service this morning. To keep faith personal, to renew passion for ministry, and as he mentioned this morning, to live a vision out every day. And as we strive to honor Case's time with us by continuing to focus on relationships, continuing to focus on keeping faith real and sharing it with those around us, I think we are well on our way as long as we continue to reach out, to draw in, and to create community. So Case, final words that I get to share with you. We will miss very much having you here with us, but you have walked with us on a tremendous journey. You have strengthened us and positioned us in a place of renewed hope and renewed optimism. While your time with us as a specialized transition minister is over, we would absolutely love to have you and Maria worship with us again, anytime. In addition case, we are absolutely going to hold you to one unfinished piece of work. And that is to sharing one more potluck together with us once you're back worshiping in person with us again. So case, we will treasure our journey together. We thank God for bringing you here to walk with us. We will continue to pray for you and Maria in the next chapter of your lives together. Thank you, Case, and may God's face continue to shine on you. Amen. <laughs>